Oh. Yes. Jalloway. Here. Peyton Hill. Here. Figueroa. Here. Rigo. All right, thank you. Uh, James, could you please read our Fenton mission beliefs and bison way statements? Sure. Mission statement cultivate successful, passionate learners through rigor, relevant relationships. Our belief statement successful, passionate learners thrive when we champion innovative teaching and engage in learning, school and home collaborative effectively. We provide a safe, secure, and caring environment. We infuse social and emotional learning into academic and culture. Diversity empowers our learning community. We, we prepare students to fulfill their civic duties. The Bison Way. Students and adults at Fenton High School create a safe, caring, empathetic environment where we believe in each other, respect diversity, communicate openly, grow together, and hold each other to high expectation to become the leaders and innovators of the future. All right, thank you, James. Uh, now we move on to recognitions. Uh, James, could you present, please? Sure. As many of you have already known, the Chicago Bears visited Fenton High School uh, on two separate occasions to celebrate members of our football team. In partnership with Athletico Physical Therapy, the Bears created a new recognition program that selects nine students uh, throughout Illinois to receive their Chicago Bears High School Community All-Star Award. Out of all the applicants, Fenton senior Eric Moreno was ranked number one. On November 12th, um, I'm sorry, on November 12th, the Bears distributed a press release naming Eric as the first ever recipient in announcing a $500 donation made in his name to Shriner Hospital for the children. The very next day, Eric and coach Matthew Lynch were on WGN radio talking about Fenton's commitments to community service and why Eric chose the Schreiner Hospital for children. It was a thrill, no doubt. But then two weeks later, the Bears returned right before Thanksgiving and announced Fenton senior Nicholas Ben as their third recipient. Nicholas also chose to have his donation sent to the Schreiner Hospital for children. You heard correctly, an all-star team of nine students from all over Ordinary students. Go, Nick, and go. Jim? I think we had a President spike Liedemann, in the internet. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, Mr. Antego, administration. Thank you for the opportunity to present Nicholas Ben and Eric Moreno. It is truly an honor and a privilege to have had the pleasure of working with two such fine young men. On behalf of the athletic department and the football coaching staff, we, we thank both Nicholas and Eric for being a service not only to the football team, the school, but to the community. At this time, I would like to present Coach Sabala to speak on Eric's behalf. Well, what can I say? In coaching, every once in a while, you get a really special kid, and that is what Eric Moreno is. I've had the pleasure of coaching Eric going on three years now. When I first got to know him, he was a bit shy, and not at all the person he has grown into today. Eric has shown all the great qualities of a true leader on and off the football field. His accolades are too many to list, but what made me really realize that this is only the beginning for him is that he helped me become a better coach. He did this by showing me no matter what happens in life, you persevere. Your work ethic never changes. 
And to, to be able to teach an old coach like myself this is something pretty special. Eric has not even reached his full potential, as he is fully aware, amazingly aware, very aware of this. This award is only the beginning for him, and his star has yet reached its brightest moment. I am honored and privileged to be able to speak on his behalf, and more importantly, be a small part of his life. Thank you. Thank you, Coach Sabawa. Ladies and gentlemen, Nicholas Ben is a young man that exhibits ex ex extreme character. It is very rare to have someone come into high school and grow with the maturity in which he has grown. We have been pretty fortunate in the football program to get the opportunity to work with, with Nicholas for the past three and a half years and, and see him on a daily basis. However, it is more, we're more fortunate as a school community to have a young man that is willing to give up himself and look, look for the better good, look at the better good of, of everyone that he encounters. Nicholas is a young man that works extremely hard. He exhibits great character and great morality. As, as the head football coach and on behalf of all the coaches, we are blessed to have him as part of the football program. The Chicago Bears and Athletic Physical Therapy bestowed these honors upon Nicholas and Eric that we are so proud of. Because as football coaches, we enjoy and get an opportunity to work with them on a daily basis and we see what they do. But now to have outside organizations like, like the Chicago Bears and Athletic Physical Therapy to recognize and honor them, it is a testament not only to the football program, but to the school and the community. You don't get to the, you don't get to this place in life without having mom and dad play a major part in a major role. We are so grateful that Mr. and Mrs. Ben and Mr. and Mrs. Moreno have given us the opportunity to work with their sons. At this time, I'd like to present Eric Moreno. First of all, uh, I want to say that it's a huge honor to uh, even be recognized with the Chicago Bears, but it's an even bigger honor to be recognized by Fenton School Board. Um, I want to mention that um, Fenton is a great place. I, I would really, I choose uh, no other place to be at. There's no other place to grow and develop. Um, there's no other way I would meet the special coaches that I met along the way. Coach Sabala and Coach Lynch have helped me uh, tremendously throughout my life. And without getting too emotional, um, I wouldn't be where I am without them. And I am forever, ever, ever grateful uh, towards them. Um, Again, uh, even uh, in this call, Nick Ben and other friends along the way um, have gotten me to where I am, um, whether it be through school or just through relationships in general. So I thank um, all the people that have been with me, especially my parents. And again, I'm more than grateful to be even recognized by a school board, especially Fenton's, which is most definitely the best. Go Bison, all right? Thank you, guys. Thank you, Eric. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Wow. Nicholas Ben. Yeah, first off, thank you to the school board for allowing us this opportunity to be recognized. Um, there's so many great aspects that really go into this award. I mean, whether it be helping in the community, athletics, or just overall being a good person. And um, I'm just so glad because it even though I'm getting the award, it, it's really reflecting Fenton High School and the coaches there and all my teammates on the football team and all the people in our community. And so it, it really does show how strong of a community we have, and it shows the great things that are going on at Fenton. And um, I, I couldn't ask to be a part of anything else. It's been nothing but great. But I'm very honored to receive this award, thankful for everybody in my life, and I'm happy to be a part of Fenton High School. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you for the opportunity. It is truly an honor, it's truly an honor and a blessing to present before you. Have a wonderful evening.
as, as uh, Mr. Lynch said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, wasn't that fantastic? We're not done yet. Okay, the Chicago Bears, we're not done yet. We have more to present here. Principal Lazarevich will explain in the next video. All right, good evening. We're here with uh, with Coach Matt Lynch, as well as our athletic director, Todd Becker. And uh, I'm Jovan Lazarevich, the fortunate principal at Fenton High School. So as you just saw, the Chicago Bears were very generous in recognizing the incredible contributions of two Fenton student football players. While here to present their awards, the Bears were impressed by what they saw of our school atmosphere and the leadership that brought these two men to the forefront. That leadership in large part comes from Coach Matt Lynch. With the Bears set to play on Monday Night Football a week after being at Fenton, it was their turn to partner with ESPN and select an NFL High School Coach of the Week. The Bears wanted to put Coach Lynch into the mix, and they asked us to quietly compile some highlights and photos. As we expected, Coach Lynch and his many admirable qualities rose to the top, and on November 16th, a short, a short segment aired on ESPN's pregame show. So, Coach Becker here. Uh, Coach Lynch? We would like to uh, say congratulations on becoming the or being selected the National High School Coach of the Week. And thank you for all you do for our community and for the students here at Fenton High School. So um, as Mr. Becker has barked that out for us, um, we have a, a chance. And, and one of the things that I, I'd like to say about Coach Lynch is, is that it's about education for him. Uh, the, the, the field is a, an extension of the classroom for him. What he teaches on the field are things that go on in the classroom on a daily basis. And so it's quite impressive to see how those two actually move between each other. So some of the things that have happened here uh, under Coach Lynch's leadership, uh, he ab goes above and beyond for all of his, his students, um, whether it's for them to get into colleges or even just as a job reference for his student, for his athletes, as well as his students here. Uh, Coach Lynch is extremely thorough in his letters of recommendation. Um, he's brought the, the team to Shriners Hospital, which our two athletes have actually donated the monies that they received from uh, the Chicago Bears to that. Uh, Coach Lynch uh, organizes a dinner at school uh, before the homecoming game. He invites all of his previous players. Uh, he really makes it a family atmosphere, what's going on. Uh, Coach Lynch has read to the Bensonville Park District Pool, which is pretty cool, actually. Uh, right at the beginning of school to have all of his athletes and have others come in to have this pool party. Um, he's done so many fine things, not just for the football program, but for Fenton High School. So we're really fortunate uh, to have him be part of our staff as part of our family here at Fenton. So Coach Lynch, I want to give you a chance. Uh, how did you feel about uh, the, the honor and, um, and anything else that you'd like to add? Um, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I was taken back by it. Um, you know, Really, not much for me to say on that. Is that I was just taken back, and really, it's a testament to the student athletes. Um, I'm just doing what I feel is part of my responsibilities, and trying to make every day, make sure every day that I I give these these kids an opportunity to grow, and and that's how I I, I look at it, as simply as that. Well, great. Thanks, Matt. I'll be honest with you. I feel these students are very fortunate to have you in both lights, whether it's in the classroom every day with the work that you do with our students or it's um, in the weight room as you push them to, to exceed their abilities or it's on the actual football field where you're teaching them kind of life skills and definitely uh, the strategies that go into to making really good decisions. So uh, thank you. We're very fortunate to have you. And, um, and I'm glad that the Bears and the NFL actually recognize this, maybe there will be some kind of worldwide or national-wide uh, recognition for you, too. So thank you for the work you do, Coach Lynch. We truly appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. And each Monday here on NFL Live, we'll put the spotlight on a high school football coach of the week. This week, the Bears have selected Fenton High School's Matthew Lynch, and Coach Lynch inspires and empowers his team to serve the community with various projects, like the team's annual trip to the Shriners Hospital for Children, the Fenton Bison, scheduled to play in the spring as their season was postponed due to COVID-19. All right, that was ESPN. Great job. Way to go, Coach. Let's give him another hand. All right, next. 
We want to recognize another individual, our president, uh, Paul Wiedemann, for being honored the Thomas Lay Burroughs Award this year. Uh, president Wiedemann, thank you for all of your hard work these last six years, uh, from the Chromebook initiatives to the construction project, to food for families, to the equity initiatives, to a COVID-19 pandemic, and always putting kids first. Thank you, thank you for your service and dedication to Fenton. We have a video here where Paul uh, receives his award from the state uh, superintendent, uh, Dr. Carmen Ayala. So we have um, a, a Dr. Ayala and Dr. Tom Bertrand, um, uh, one of our part strong uh, partners, um, who's uh, executive director of the Illinois Association of School Boards, and they're here to present uh, the Thomas Lay Burroughs Award um, to uh, one of our esteemed board members in the state. Thank you, Darren. Looking at notes here, I apologize. Um, yes, we are going to be announcing the recipient of our annual Thomas Lay Burroughs Award for the state's outstanding school board president. Uh, the Illinois State Board of Education created this award in 1991 to honor the late Thomas Lay Burroughs, who served as chair of the State Board of Education and as president of the board for Collinsville School District 10. This award recognizes extraordinary local leadership, particularly in the following areas, improving student learning, closing achievement gaps, and supporting educational excellence, expanding educational opportunities for underserved students, and resolving a crisis of major difficulty with the result of more equitable outcomes for students. The official presentation is going to be taking place uh, at the Illinois Association of School Boards virtual meeting this Saturday, but we were excited to give everyone uh, tuning in today a sneak peek at the winner. We received many, many high quality nominations. Illinois is lucky to have such dedicated and collaborative public servants who go above and beyond for the students they serve. This year, one particular nominee stood out from the crowd, one who shares ISBE's mission to ensure that all students received an equitable education and is described as a champion for every student of every background. That person is Paul Wedeman, School Board President of Fenton Community High School District 100. Congratulations, Paul. Paul describes his approach to leadership saying, equity is not about equality. It is about fairness and meeting students and families where they are. Under Paul's leadership, Fenton changed the culture of its advanced placement program and broke down barriers that made participation more difficult for underrepresented students. The number of advanced placement exams taken by students has almost tripled and the number of AP exams resulting in college credit has soared from 155 to 420. That leadership also earned the district the International 2019 College Board's AP District of the Year Award. In addition, Paul has led the district in efforts to close the digital divide by providing mobile hotspots and in-home high-speed internet for low-income families and by securing Chromebooks for all students. Since being elected to the board in 2015, the board and district's equity-centered decisions have had a tangible impact on students' outcomes. The percentage of ninth grade students on track to graduate has jumped up eight points in just four years. And the district's graduation rate has increased from 85 to 94 percent. On behalf of the Illinois State Board of Education, Paul, congratulations and thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Dr. Ayala and board members. Thank you, Illinois State Board of Education. And thank you to the family of Thomas Lay Burroughs for sharing such a great man with schools across Illinois and for letting my name be spoken in the same breath as his. However, I accomplished nothing on my own. Mission as important as equity requires many, many people to buy in. And I have an incredible team of people at my side. I want to share 
this award with my current and former Fenton School Board members who work together this vital mission at Fenton High School. I want to share this award with our current and former Fenton employees who brought us great recommendations to choose from and who carried out much of the heavy lifting. And finally, I want to share this award with our amazing students, their parents, and the community members who embraced the Bison Way and supported our efforts through thick and thin. In fact, this is less of an award and more of a sign that we at Fenton High School are on the right track. But make no mistake, there is a lot more work to do in, in creating and maintaining a fair and equitable school for every child in Bensonville and Wooddale. Again, thank you, thank you for this great honor. I truly appreciate it. Thank you, congratulations. And, and uh, Chairman Reesberg, thank you very much for inviting me and affording me the opportunity to congratulate Paul. Paul, uh, it certainly takes strong and committed leadership to apply that equity lens to the six foundational principles of effective governance that the Illinois Association of School Boards teaches its member boards. And on behalf of the 848 member school boards, nearly 6,000 public servants who continue to serve our children in what will be remembered as the most challenging period in the history of public education in this country. Congratulations to you, Paul, and to your entire leadership team at Fenton. Thank you. Again, thank, thank you so much. And I will uh, pass, pass that on. Thanks so much. Thank you, Paul. And, and thank you, uh, Tom, again, as I said to Jason earlier today, um, when um, uh, he came to do public participation, um, I just wanna thank you for your leadership of the Illinois Association of School Boards and for the association um, and for all of its members for um, what has been a particularly trying uh, year for everybody. Um, and, uh, um, you know, just, uh, I know that um, it's been um, not just trying, but exhausting um, and just wanna thank you for your leadership during these times. So both to you and Paul, uh, congratulations uh, for all that you're doing for the state and for your kids. Sure, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Way to go, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I'm, I'm truly, uh, I'm, I'm very humbled and, uh, and uh, I'm very appreciative of it. And I just want to say that it is a team effort and I, I am really touched and really honored to have such a great uh, board members as well as team uh, around me, as well as other other staff members in which we all accomplished this uh, together. And I just wanted to say thank you again, and I'm very humbled. Congratulations, Paul. Okay, thank you. Thanks thank for all you. your hard work. No problem, thank you. All right, um, we move on to Public comments, uh, James, do we have any requests for public comments? Yes, we do, we have five. Five, okay, um, as a reminder, public comments are limited to three minutes per speaker with a limit of 30 minutes per topic. Superintendent Antenko will read the public comments received in chrono chronological order. Thank you. Uh, this first comment is from Emma Butts. The following stories are testaments regarding acts of discrimination witnessed and experienced at Fenton High School, which were collected by the Fenton Advocacy Network. I'm afraid to simply wear certain clothes without getting hateful comments from other students. I don't have the confidence I used to have just because of how what I wear can supposedly define who I am as a person. To other students, I wear it because I want to look pretty. Submitted anonymously. This story is, is pertaining to the 2016 election. Obviously knowing that only a small percentage of our class would vote at this time, a staff member had an open door policy and most of the time with her office and allowed her students to come in and sit if needed. Not only students did, did go in there, but there were a group of favorites that would talk in there often. The students were talking about their choices for the upcoming election, listing out pro, uh, pros and cons about each candidate. 
the next day she sat in our class and began to talk about having an, her open uh, office and having the groups in there talking about the views that were against her. She began to start yelling that she started talking. It, it is a threat to her family. She also slammed something and got up and continued yelling. And by the end of it, all she stopped crying and had us continue on with class, submitted anonymously. Next public comment is from Jessica Bango. My name is Jessica Bango. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a class of the 2016 Fenton alum. alum. In, August, in the August board meeting, Ms. Um, staff highlighted that equity is not just a checkbox. Um, board members stress we must be empathetic allies for marginalized group and individual added, we must also advocate for these groups. Individual emphasized we must dis dismantle historic oppressive systems to establish equity, to be a diverse high school that yearns for equity to at the same time ignore the discrimination felt on Fenton's campus is an injustice to our community. I presented these words four months ago and their importance remains true. Since then, other alumni and I became uh, become the Fenton Advocacy Network. We have, we have continued the conversation by sharing stories that serve as testaments to discrimination and equities at Fenton. Though the board defines Fenton's with empathy accolades, unfulfilled goals, and misleading data, these stories are very real. They happen. They are happening. There is no war that a Fenton could ever attain that would devalue or resolve the ineffective or lack of policies regarding discrimination. As the board continues to be silent, we recognize that our goals may not be met with current composition of the board. With that said, I want to highlight the importance of the upcoming board election in April in April, to those listening and listening later. Your vote is a voice. Individual one, individual two, individual three, and individual four are candidates who are running for the position on the on board. The election is April. They are each unique, passionate, and driven about transparency and conducting dialogue. As community members voting in the upcoming board election for multiple of fresh new candidates, we will be crucial to ensure the public concerns are taken seriously. And the action is taken not for, for, but with the community. This current board has ignored us for five months and ignored a petition with 600 alumni and community members signatures calling for the creation and implementation of a diversity action plan. It is up to you to decide if the change we all wish to see can transpire with the current composition of the board. To the current board, we have not given up. The unfortunate truth is that we have extended the invitation to you every single month and you have ignored us. It was never about raising opposition against you, but raising awareness to get uh, towards pertinent issues of diversity and equity that affects your student past, present, and future. It's been five months of, of submitting comments, but the equity journey is everlasting. We will never cease challenging you. All do your best to ensure that Fenton truly becomes a more welcoming and equitable environment. Thank you. Third comment is from Jose Diaz. To whom it may concern, when I was a sophomore, I was battling deeply rooted identity issues regarding validation and self-worth as a, as a closeted gay teen. At that time, there was a little to no visibility, curriculum, or resources to learn more about sexual orientation and identity. And thus, for the greater portion of high school career, I remained closeted as a means of self-preservation, regret, regretfully. A specific instance, microaggression, if you will, which undoubtedly entrenched me into further hiding my true self, self occurred that same year. I will omit the victim's names who was discriminated, but they were there were, but there they were a teacher in a social studies department and was heavily involved in extracurricular, a prominent figure at Fenton. I was waiting in the halls after the 307 p.m. bell rang to enter our fitness center, which opened at 3.30 p.m. Typically, what you'll find in that half, half hour leading up to the gym, opening in students, our students socializing, studying, bantering, or for myself, decompressing in a moment of peace, a great escape for everyone. However, this instance scared the way I perceived the culture at Fenton, and I no longer felt 
the moment of peace ever again for the rest of my, my, my time there. The teacher was walking by in a narrow hallway during the time, minding her business when a group of boys uh, started mumbling under their, their tongues. She looks like a guy. Is she a boy? They called explicitive language, Jude. I was in shock, literally unable to speak as the teacher turned around and yelled back at the chuckling boys in an act of distress. There are cameras watching you say that, you know. At that moment, I knew, I knew she too felt defeated, not knowing how to properly react to, to such stark and, and bearing discrimination coming from students who should not only understand and respect freedom of identity expression, but also completely lack the respect of their teacher. Seeing her response, seeing the students feel as though they got the last laugh traumatized me, traumatized me to the point where I vividly, out of a handful of high school memories, remember this one the most. Following the incident, I spent weeks wondering why I didn't speak up and instead kept my head low, absorbed when I felt I felt was something Fenton would never outgrow, a toxic environment for the LGBTQ plus community, both for its students and staff. As an adult, I realized this is not the fault of those students. This is the fault of the institutional ignorance by not instilling comprehensive values of diversity and inclusion upon step, stepping into the halls of Fenton. The students were merely an echo of what Fenton did or didn't care about. At that, at that time, GSA uh, was in its nascency and not broadly adopted by the staff, students, and faculty. There was, there was no repercussion or education for their outright acts of discrimination. There was only one of the several incidents I experienced. Thankfully, I was strong and persevered. However, for all my brothers and sisters in the LGBTQ plus community, I cannot say the same and to this day worry about their well-being in the halls of Fenton. Thank you. Next comment, my name is Talia Aguiano. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I am a graduate of Fenton class of 2013. I'd like to start off by congratulating the board president on his recent ISB award for his leadership and efforts and centered around equity. As I am sure you very well know, based on the composition of this award, diversity, equity, inclusion work is hard. So achieving this is absolutely amazing because this and the leadership position you hold on the board, I'm positive that there would be no issues to continuing to advance the efforts of equity and inclusion across the district. The Fenton Advocacy Network is a community group that has been centered on advocacy for our traditionally marginalized students and, and education surrounding hate, bias, discrimination, and racism experience or witness at Fenton. We have created a list of demands that will further advance the areas of equity and inclusion in the district and we'll love to partner with the board president and his members. We demand bullet uh, reconsideration of the approval, approved diversity and equity statement to include different identities of students, the creation of a diversity, equity and inclusion committee that, that includes students and community members, the implementation of ma mandatory diversity, equity and inclusion training for all the students and staff, having a regular diversity, equity and inclusion workshop for students and staff, assembling and designated space for marginalized group, hiring a counselor and mentor specifically for a marginalized group, analysis of trans and discipline referral data, attendance and academic success, post media virtually and physically that supports black and brown communities through both statement and pictures, creation, uh, creation a zero tolerance policy for acts of discrimination, attending events in class of your current students, scheduling speakers and authors of diverse background to speak, hosting a Q&A with a community, present, present your views and conduct a dialogue. Aside from demands, we are inviting the board to work with us and to be actively anti-racist and genuinely empathetic in the way that alumni and current students need. Your support is invaluable to our mission. As part of defending advocacy goals, we have chosen to share stories with you that testify to discrimination of all kinds at Fenton, past and present. We are asking you to open your hearts and put yourselves in these authors' shoes. Please realize that the authors behind these words are or were students who felt unsafe, silenced, and oppressed. These students' experiences are what you erased in your equity statement. Awards are nice, but true active equity work is even nicer. 
we will be holding a future town hall over Zoom to continue the conversation. We are hoping that you will be part of the equity journey to make Fenton a more supportive and welcoming environment for all so that, fu that future Fenton graduates will not feel as though their misfortune is the product of our inaction. Thank you. The last public comment um, is by uh, Patrick Escobedo, President Wiedemann and Board of uh, Board Members. Uh, season's greeting from FEA. We hope you are well and wish you a happy new year. This time of year is always an opportunity to look back in, re in reflection, as well as to look forward with optimism and we invite the board to join us in this process. As we review our year, we are quite pleased with the formation of the equity community, the development of our equity statement and video and work towards diversity, equity and inclusion that our unions has engaged in. Our dedication to equity has animated our work with the districts through EOS talks and DELT, as well as the independent work as a union as we have pursued opportunities for training, education and activism on our own. Our first amending training on no, uh, November 16 was highly informative and we are participating in an inclusive curriculum law training on January 11th and February 5th. We would very much like to establish a time where we can share our conclusion takeaways and from the training with the Board of Education, creating an inclusive curriculum is something that the teachers and staff are dedicated to and something that we are sure the Board of Education also cares deeply about. Establishing this time where we can come together and debrief over what we learn about the inclusion curriculum law uh, would send a strong message of collaboration and solidarity to, to your teachers and students. As we head into new year, we also would like to strongly encourage the board to reflect on the practices regarding discussion during the open session of your meeting. Last month, we called on the board to break their veil of silence that the public comments are met with. And alas, we are disappointed to say that to our knowledge that the board continues its practice and of offering little to no follow-up in response to people who take the time to time to, to compose and deliver a statement to the board. We hope at least that if you are not willing to meaningfully engage with their constituents and staff who offer public comments, that at least you will begin to meaningfully engage with each other. Last month's discussion of remote learning plan was a rare exception to the board's uh, apparent reticence to discuss, debate, and engage with one another on the important issue during the open session of the board meetings. As elected public officials, you have a duty to, to your constituents to clarify your position on important votes, initiatives, and policies the board takes up. If the board does not wish to follow up on public comments, then the board discussion during open session is the only way the public can learn and understand where the board and its members stand on important issues facing the school. We encourage members of the board to use the open sessions of the meetings to express their views, build consensus and defend their position on important issues in order to create a transparent and democratic body for the stakeholders. In conclusion, we wish you a happy new year and we would like very much appreciate a response to our comments. Kindness regards Patrick Escobedo, President Fenton Education Association. That is the last comment. All right, that was the last one, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to thank uh, Emma Butts, Jessica Bango, Jose Diaz, Talia Aguiano, and Patrick Escobedo for your valuable input. We appreciate you all for taking the time and submitting your comments. Please note, we are not ignoring your, your comments or any comments. We take all comments seriously. No student or staff should experience any form of discrimination and hate. I want to make this crystal clear. We are resolute in fostering a diverse, equitable, and inclusive learning and cultural environment that refutes any discrimination that may occur. Discrimination and hate is not tolerated here. We have always championed diversity, equity, and inclusion, and there is more work to be done. We look forward to any uh, town hall meeting that may occur. Thank you all for your uh, comments. Um, now we move on to the District 100 informational items. James? Sure, a couple of things here, uh, COVID updates here, equity report, uh, the different schedules and the report card. Um, 
unfortunately, uh, as of Monday, uh, approximately 53,000 uh, individuals in DuPage have, uh, have com confirmed cases of COVID, 841 deaths. Here's our metrics here. As you can see, you see the red, we're still insubstantial. As you know, it's the highest level of uh, in the framework with community transmission level. Uh, there is a trend. If you look at the blue arrows going down in each of the columns, there is a trend going down. We're in week 48 of COVID. Um, let's just go row by row real quick. Uh, the Illinois Department of IDPH basically is in the orange, which is the highest level, which is the DuPage County Public Health Department's metrics for substantial. Uh, new cases per 100,000, it has dipped down to 439, still high, uh, which ranks it too substantial. Weekly case count from week 47 to 48, uh, a decrease of approximately negative um, 28 uh, percent. Weekly youth uh, count um, rates have also decreased this week of uh, week 47 to 48, uh, a negative 35.2 percent. So we're seeing that go down a little bit, but still high in general as a, ma a macro look at our, our COVID metrics. Um, weekly positivity rate has also gone down. Um, I believe last time, uh, last week it was 12.18%. It is at 11.7, still pretty high to put us at substantial. That's why it's red. And lastly, our neighboring uh, counties are also in substantial. Next slide. Here is the overall look. It's a trend still up. We see some little decrease here but in general if you look at that whole graph going across there's that arc still at that level we would like that to spike down uh so does everyone else um, next slide this one is uh by residents um same trend here different level if you could go back up i i, I miss I thought I was looking at the wrong slide could you go back this is the age i apologize the age group as you can see green is uh, basically uh, 5 to 14, the red is 13 to 19, and blue is 0 to 4. It's the same trend. So our little, little kids are, are much lower, and as, uh, as folks get older, um, the, it tends to go up with that with, is the trend. It seems like the middle school kids are a little high here as well. Next slide. This is the overall look um, for our population, okay? Um, still low compared to what we saw, in the, uh, I'm sorry, still high compared to what we saw last spring. Here's by county. Uh, Bensonville is about, at, uh, in regards to COVID cases, 17, 1,700 cases. Wooddale is uh, just over 1,000. Next slide. Here's by age group. Zero to nine is the far left bar uh, um, graph there, uh, followed by our high school students there. And... Uh, the folks that tend to have COVID cases are between 20 and uh, 59 years of age. So this is just a good format there. So vaccines, you, you've heard it. It has arrived here at, um, at DuPage Monday. We met with, uh, I met with the DuPage County Public Health staff uh, and uh, they reported that uh, there are 13,000 13, vaccines arrived in DuPage on Monday, expecting new batches every week. Okay, healthcare providers and long-term facility individuals are the first to receive the vaccines. Okay, you've heard that in the news. We've heard that in the news as well. There are approximately here in DuPage forty-three thousand healthcare providers, forty-three thousand and thirteen thousand long-term facility individuals. You see it right there. Not enough vaccine. Um, educators in school. Uh, there isn't a, a clear date when that will happen. Um, they're thinking sometime in, in February, March, uh, uh, we, will, we will get our dose there. There are two shots for the Pfizer vaccine, a primary shot, as you know, and the sh second shot is given to the individual 21 days later. In regards to the quarantine, there, uh, as you can see, CDC, you still heard it in the news, um, there, is, there was talk about reducing the number of quarantine days when people are in clo close contact or when people are tested positive. IDPH and, and uh, DuPage County Public Health does not recommend reducing the quarantine time, okay? And Fenton will follow those recommendations. So uh, we're, we're still sticking with that 14-day quarantine, okay? Since it's not recommended by uh, 
the scientists here in Illinois. Testing in schools, you've heard probably a handful of schools are looking into testing in their school districts. Um, currently, DuPage County Public Health Department is, recommend, uh, is not recommending this, okay? It is not a requirement. Uh, currently as well, we do not have a plan to roll this out, okay? Uh, however, we are looking into the topic just in case it becomes a requirement, obviously. Uh, we are doing our research in regards to the cost, how much that would cost the district, what kind of facilities we need to have, are there ex extra staffing that needs to be involved, uh, the different companies that offer this, the testing, and what kind of procedures it will take. So I'll continue to report on the, uh, this to the board uh, from month to month, but right now it's not recommended, it's not a requirement. Uh, in regards to IHSA, um, uh, there's not much to report here. Sports and practices for our athletes are on hold, okay? Uh, so what are our sports teams doing and our clubs doing at this time? They're meeting virtually. So there's contact that way. It's all virtual at this time. As you know, we're in mitigation three, um, and um, we are not uh, participating at this time. Next up is our equity report. Um, just quick, quickly, as you know, we had an audit uh, last year. Uh, the audit was completed. and um, we have established a district equity leadership team called DELT. We met twice this semester. Um, uh, our director of curriculum and instruction, Michelle Papanikolaou, our principal Lazarevich, and I are in communication with Dr. Dubiel regarding the next semester's meeting. Uh, we're gonna continue moving forward with the constructing and then implementation and action plans coming from the equity audit. Um, good news here too as well. I know we brought this up. Diversity, equity, inclu inclusion training will start with staff next semester. And again, Dr. Dubiel will facilitate this training. Uh, just just as we, before we go to our, our next presentation and in our equity journey, uh, just wanted to remind the board that we did the equity audit. We've taken steps doing this. We, we reported on the equity and professional development for our staff, okay? Uh, we reported the equity outreach with our parents and, and groups, kind of like Padres Unidos, our Polish outreach, our, our bilingual parents. Uh, we discussed equity with student programming, uh, for example, equal opportunity schools and different student clubs. Uh, tonight, we will uh, review equity uh, regarding restorative justice. Let me introduce that real quick, uh, Jim, before you play it. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Uh, this month, we will feature our deans, Mr. Uh, Pedro Castro and Mr. Jason Madel. They prepared a video presentation which discusses how they have practiced equity through restorative justice in the dean's department and how they interact and build relationship with our students. Take it away, Jim. Good evening, everyone. This is Pedro Castro and Jason Madel, deans over at Fenton High School. We want to talk with you this evening about FHS's restorative justice equity journey. Before we go into the journey, just wanted to give you an overview of our presentation. We'll be talking about some background data, some background, some data, and some research. Uh, we'll talk about what is restorative justice. How does restorative justice look at Fenton? We're also going to illustrate our equity journey through the use of restorative justice practices. Before we go into the actual presentation, I would like for you to consider this. The Alliance for Education published a report in 2013 which indicated a ninth grader who is suspended once increase, increase is two times more likely to drop out. So in other words, if a ninth grader is suspended from school one time, he increases the ability for that student to drop out of school from 16 to 32%. A second suspension for that ninth grader increases the risk of dropping out from 16 to 42%. So for this reason, we think about alternatives to suspension. We want to be able to keep students in the building when it's safe and when it's doable. So um, here you have some statistics for Fenton discipline, Fenton discipline over the last nine years from 2010 through 2019. I do want to highlight, which is highlighted there for 16 and 17 school year. In January of 2016, Senate Bill 100 went into effect. Although we started implementing some of Senate Bill 100 requirements in the fall of 2016, um, it was fully implemented, uh, at least the requirements of the, the bill 
in 2016 and 2017. So as far as traditional discipline, I just want to explain what is that. So we here at Fenton use a traditional discipline system that was rooted in rules-based, uh, punitive, managerial, authoritative approach, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, that did not incorporate student input in terms of writing a wrong. I did want to make a distinction between student input here and student input as it relates to due process. When we talk about due process, students are in the dean's office for uh, a violation of a school policy or a violation of something that has not gone um, well or didn't go as a student planned. So we want student input uh, as far as learning what happened, their point of view. That's due process. This student input talks more about righting a wrong. We want students to be involved in the process so that they can learn from the mistakes and they can also be part of the process to be able to write that wrong. So second point here is that uh, quote from Urban Herb, student accountability fails in a system monitored by the teacher and void of student input. That student input is important for student accountability. Uh, without this opportunity, the behavior of the harm is repeated because the root or the initial concern has not been addressed. And this is where we get recidivism. We want to be able to address things uh, the first go around so that students don't make the same mistakes over and over again. So getting at the root. Um, third point, harm or misbehavior is perceived, is perceived as a violation of rules and laws versus a violation of people and relationships. This is key because we want to focus on individuals. We want to focus on their relationships with others. And if the focus is on um, students did not, for example, come to school on time, when we talk with students about how does your not being in school on time, how does that affect others? So it's having students go through all the steps of that. And sometimes we'll need to say it was just me, but there's more to it. So we want to focus on the relationships and the people that are harmed when there is a misbehavior or harm that has happened. Lastly, the implementation of Senate Bill 100 requires that, student, that schools show a student continued presence, that a student's continued presence in the building will create an eminent threat to the student, to others uh, and staff, and or to the building uh, before any kind of suspension were to happen. From there, we go into the seven principles that guide restorative justice practice in education. And this is adapted from the restorative justice in education uh, article. Um, seven principles, the first one states, we want to meet student needs. That's exactly what equity is all about. Every, every student is an individual with individual needs. So we want to be able to meet their needs where they are um, in, whenever anything either good or bad happens. In this case, in the dean's office, when a harm has happened, we want to still be able to meet the student's needs. Second is we want to provide accountability and support for students. Even though a student may have harmed somebody else, there's that accountability that is important but we also want to be able to support them even throughout that process so they can, again, learn from that. And the third point, tied into the second, we want to make things right as best we can. So this will include the person who did the harm and the person who was harmed by that act. Um, we definitely want to view conflict as a learning opportunity. So any, anything that happens in the building, whether it's good or bad, it's an opportunity for a student to learn and we want them to be able to learn, uh, particularly from mistakes, so that they don't repeat those mistakes. We want to build healthy learning communities by having students being able to hold themselves accountable. We start doing that by having students see how they have harmed somebody else and become part of that process to, to restore the, um, the harm that was committed. Um, they are learning from that. Um, and we want to restore relationships. Um, that's the key to all this by having, by building those strong relationships, students can then feel accountable for what they've done for to others and then again, address that recidivism we talked about a little bit ago. We also wanna make sure that we address power imbalances. As we talk about uh, equity, we want students who did not always necessarily have that voice to be able to, to um, speak up for themselves, to advocate for themselves. We are giving them that voice, we're giving them that capacity or building that capacity in them to be able to have their voice heard. Uh, again, basic principles of, equ of uh, equity also tie into restorative justice. With that, Mr. Madel will tell us a little bit more about restorative justice. Thank you, Mr. Castro. So if we were going to break down restorative justice a little bit further, um, it is based on three core tenets. The first being what harm has occurred. The second being who was harmed. And the third would be how can the situation uh, be resolved in the most positive way for each party involved. And that is important because we are talking about how to resolve this um, in a beneficial way for the person who was harmed, 
as well as the person who did the harm. Okay, so the question may come up, why restorative justice? Um, aside from all the reasons Mr. Castro explained, and there are plenty, uh, we have kind of broken it down to two major reasons, um, both equally important in my opinion. The first goal is um, designed to keep the students in the classroom. Restorative justice designed to keep the students in the classroom. Uh, exclusionary discipline impacts learning by removing students from the learning environment. So what are we saying here? We're saying that basically anytime we take the student out of the classroom or discipline, whether it's an out of school suspension, whether it's um, an in-school suspension, whether it's anything along those lines, anything that takes a student out of the classroom is going to impact their learning negatively. So our first goal is to develop a, um, a system of discipline that's going to limit as much as possible these exclusionary um, practices. Uh, the second goal is, as I said, equally as important. It's going to touch on um, a different type of, uh, of goal, um, and that would be the social emotional needs of our students. So what we have here is restorative justice is designed to meet student social emotional needs. Students develop an awareness and understanding of the other person's feelings and perspective. This process of coming together to address the situation fosters healing and restoration. So once again, uh, we are talking about empathy. We are talking about um, teaching a student to view a situation through the other student's eyes, uh, to understand that not everybody has had the same experiences, that there are these inequities and that we need to be cognizant of these and we need to be able to work with one another regardless of these inequities. And there is a way to work through confrontation without violence, without um, shaming, without bullying, without all of those things. And so that's the type of thing we're talking about as our second goal with restorative justice. So um, <clears throat> the impact of restorative justice is in that Restorative justice is active. It's going to be more effective in changing behavior, which is the entire goal of what we do up in the dean's office. Um, it's going to be much more effective because the student is actively working to change their behavior or to right a wrong. Whereas traditional discipline is simply a punishment, right? Um, it's passive, meaning the student has really no no say, no active role at all in, um, in what's happening. You know, they're, they're sent to a room for 25 minutes to sit there. A lot of times they're not going to be reflecting on why they're there as much as we love them to, that that's not happening. So restorative justice allows for an individual to take an active role in the process of addressing and adjusting their behavior. And again, that is um, the most effective way to get a change in behavior which is, of course, exactly what we're trying to do. So we're going to talk about this uh, graphic here on the side in a moment. But before we get to it, um, back to social emotional impacts, the crux of restorative justice is the building and maintaining of relationships. And that stands for relationships uh, among students and then relationships also between the adults and the students. Those are both equally important. Uh, these relationships allow both the individual who was harmed as well as the individual who did the harming to have input in the resolution of the situation. This allows us to work with the student rather than doing to the student. So um, this graphic here, this is called the discipline window. This is probably one of the, if not the most important uh, idea with regards to restorative justice and equity. So we, you'll see that we have two axes here. The vertical is, is uh, talking about control, low to high, and the horizontal is talking about support, also low to high. You'll see that the one that is in blue probably stands out. Uh, that's the with, all right? So we'll get back to that one in a moment. That's our goal. We want to be with, with the student as we're working through something. The other three you'll see two, uh, not, or four, which are punitive, neglectful, and permissive. Those are all inequitable. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Mr. Castro mentioned earlier that 
not all the students have the benefit of learning how to advocate for themselves properly. Um, those who have learned that have a huge advantage because they're much better at things such as conflict resolution, standing up for themselves appropriately, um, things of that nature. So each of our students have unique backgrounds, they have unique experiences. And so we need to be very aware of that and we need to meet the student where they are at. We need to keep in mind that although I know how to handle someone who spoke to me the wrong way or maybe even put their hands on me, there are many of us who, who don't know how to do that in, I guess, what we could call as a socially appropriate way. Um, their response may be to fight back, to hit, to any number of things, go on social media. We need to be aware of that all the time. And in the event that our students who are 14 to 18 years old um, and may not be able to really see that um, and have that empathy that we'd like them to have, they may not have developed that yet, we need to do that um, to help them do that. So we're going to do that with them. And when we talk about with, which you'll see is the restorative way, we're talking about basically walking with the students. And I say students because we're talking about a student that was harmed as well as a student who did the harming. We're walking with them to get to a resolution. Um, I do want to make it clear. Uh, there are certain very egregious offenses that we will not restore. Um, we will not walk with the students through it because it's not safe. Um, but in the majority of cases, we will do everything we can to get away from the doing to students um, and just handing out punishments and walking with them through the resolution. Okay, so this is another pretty important point. Um, there is, um, I would consider it a misconception a little bit that restorative justice is, is kind of warm and fuzzy and, and letting students uh, off the hook. And that's, that's not the case. Um, in fact, we view it as quite the opposite. We are forcing the students to be accountable for what they did instead of allowing them to just avoid it or pretend it didn't happen or worse yet, continue the behavior. So in order for restorative justice to be effective, it demands three things. The first is that um, something Occurring that is wrong has been affirmed by the person. So if I did something, the first thing I need to do is admit that, is affirm that, yes, I did something and that was wrong. Uh, the second thing is that I need to acknowledge that there was some harm. You know, somebody was hurt in this. I need to make sure that I'm, I'm aware of that and I'm able to verbalize that. And thirdly, um, I need to accept responsibility for, for what I've done and for who I've harmed. If I am not willing to do those things, restorative justice simply does not work. And it does need to be all three of them. None of those can be missing. So unfortunately we do have to question what happens if the student is unwilling or incapable of doing what we ask or doing what restorative justice requires. And although this is not the route we wanna go, um, the answer is simple. A student who's not willing to accept the parameters of restorative justice will receive the traditional consequences. And um, when having a conversation with the student about restorative justice, this is brought up and it is not in a threatening manner at all. What is said to the student is um, so-and-so, this is what happened. This is what we'd like to do. If you are unable or unwilling to take these steps to make this right, then um, the, the traditional consequence would be on the table and that's the route we go. However, we would prefer to avoid that and we would rather go the restorative route and do this, this, and this. But in the event that a student is not willing, um, there, there are still traditional consequences. So at this point, what I'd want to do, I'd like to do is just uh, summarize quickly our journey through at Benson, uh, how we've gotten to incorporate equity uh, some of the steps we've gone through along the way. So we started off talking about traditional discipline, um, how it's more punitive, more managerial, where we were telling students, okay, you did this, go serve a detention, as if that detention will fix what the issue was, what the harm was. 
uh, detention in and of itself will not fix anything, kind of like go to your room. That doesn't have a student reflect on the process. So we, we started from there, Senate Bill 100, which is not something we did, but the state did to help us get to this point, uh, not just us at Fenton, but other schools in the state of Illinois. That led to our district now incorporating restorative justice uh, practices, trauma-informed practices, uh, SEL um, programs here within the building. Uh, consequently, Jason and myself have both been trained in restorative justice, and uh, we are actually both restorative justice trainers. So we can also train and hopefully we, we can incorporate that here in the building and be able to train all staff here at Fenton. It is a building-wide process. It does, it does take some time and it takes some investment, um, but it is doable um, and we look forward to doing that. That being said, we have, given that we've already been trained in this, we've already incorporated some of these and there are some goals that we have for ourselves moving forward. One of the goals that we have is once we're back in the building, um, student panels, where students are part of this process, kind of like the peer mentors that we currently have. We have had several restorative conversations with students, where with the students who were the ones who did the harming and the students who uh, were harmed by the students, where we come to a resolution and both parties are part of that resolution. Restorative circles uh, is another practice where we have several people within the, the circle to talk about how that harm has affected everyone there and how as a group, we can restore the harm and bring that individual who caused the harm back into the community. So from there, we go into where we are and how we've incorporated that. By having done these things, these, these components here, we have the students demonstrate individuality. And, and that's what this is all about. Every student is an individual. We give students their voice to be able to be heard um, and to hear, uh, have others hear if they have been harmed and be part of that solution process. Uh, we also hold students accountable. It is not, as Mr. Madel mentioned, this is not a free pass where, oh, you won't get a consequence. Uh, you just think about it and that's it. So there is an accountability and the stakes of accountability are much higher because it requires reflection by the student. Uh, and that reflection, we talk about social emotional learning. Again, another key part of the equity process. And last but not least, but actually most importantly, that's, this is why we're here in the building, academic success. By having this as a foundation for students we build that capacity for students to be able to have social emotional success as well as academic success. We thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Mr. Middle and myself at the end of this PowerPoint, the next slide here, have all the references that we use in the making of this video. Uh, thank you again and have a good night. Thank you for listening. Thank you. We are very excited about that. It took uh, you know uh, a while to get that plane going uh, and building the right runway, making sure that the right pilots are on the plane, doing that, just very proud of, uh, of what uh, Mr. Madel and Mr. Castro are doing in regards to that. So hope you could appreciate that. Um, moving on to our next report here, um, COVID-19, uh, how do you survive it? Well, it's, it's planning ahead. It's looking at the data, uh, it's reflection, uh, asking for feedback, uh, and that's what we have done throughout this pandemic. And this next presentation, it's really about the second semester. Um, uh, as you know, uh, we continue to report to the board that uh, the hybrid task force as well as the remote task force continues to, to work, to meet, uh, to provide a better um, schedule for our students moving into the second quarter. Um, so with that said, I'd like to introduce uh, Principal Lazarevich to, to uh, talk a little bit before uh, he demonstrates and show the video. Uh, good evening. Thanks for, um, for your time. Um, yeah, we actually, towards the end, we, uh, as we took information, and Ms. Papanikola was, was instrumental in gathering survey data um, for us, and uh, our team broke down a lot of the survey, and we looked at uh, where we were. Remember when we first started this, we really believed that this was going to be temporary and temporary has extended to a little more than temporary, but we, we still believe that obviously there's a, a, a goal at the end and a, a site at the end. So we did take all input um, and we actually combined the remote and the hybrid team together to start to work and, and see where we can create some similarities and some schedules where we can, we can actually put them together and uh, so it'll be an easy transition for our students as they move from remote um, to um, to in-person hybrid, or it, you know um, if we have to move back, depending upon how 
what the safety uh, looks like if, if Mr. Antango needs to take a look and we move from in-person back to remote as well. So we've tried to mesh those two schedules and that way it's a, a consistency for our students as we go forward, so. Hello, Fenton High School. This is Michelle Papanicolau, Director of Curriculum and Instruction. Today, I'd like to take you through some updates for the second semester of our 2020-2021 school year. First, I'd love to commend the students, teachers, and families for their extraordinary efforts and commitment to learning this first semester. Also, I would like to thank everybody for their continual feedback through survey responses, phone calls, emails, and other forms, so we can continue to understand what our students need in this remote learning setting. Based on this feedback, I'm going to take you through a series of changes we'll be making for second semester. First of all, the daily schedule will look different for second semester. There are four particular areas that will change. First, Mondays. Mondays will look different. Students will now attend all class periods and a bison time on Monday. Second, our classes will now begin at 8.30 a.m. Monday through Friday. Unless the student is enrolled in a zero hour, then it will be earlier. Third, our students will meet with their teachers and classmates four times a week instead of two times a week. Finally, our office hours will now be available at the beginning and end of each day. Let me take you a little deeper into Mondays. Mondays, the students will meet 20 minutes on a remote live connection for every one of their class periods. Teachers will review the learning plan for the week and begin instruction. Attendance will be taken. Bison time will also continue to run on Mondays for 40 minutes. Attendance will be taken and bison time assignments will remain the same for all students. Finally, if any student is failing courses, they may be assigned to a support session on Monday afternoons. Tuesday through Friday, for students with a typical one through eight period schedule, will attend a morning session that runs from 8.30 a.m. till 12.25 p.m. Each class in this morning session will run for 55 minutes. On Tuesday and Thursday, students will attend periods four, three, two, and eight, on Wednesday and Friday, students will attend periods 5, 1, 7, and 6. The afternoon session will run from 1.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. During this session, there will be two class periods that run for 30 minutes each. On Tuesdays, students will attend periods 5 and 1. On Wednesdays, students will attend periods 4 and 3. On Thursdays, students will attend periods 6 and 7. And on Friday, students will attend periods 8 and 2. Office hours will now be held from 8 o'clock a.m. to 8.30 a.m. every Tuesday through Friday and 2.30 p.m. to 3.15 p.m. every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Students are still encouraged to use these office hours for extra support, and parents and teachers are encouraged to connect during these times as well. Here's a grid format of the remote daily schedule for second semester. You will see a morning session and an afternoon session on Monday, the morning session will consist of all class periods and a bison time. You'll see a 45 minute lunch. And then during the afternoon session for students who are assigned, there will be a support session from 1245 to 145. Then you will see Tuesday through Friday, first thing in the morning, there's a zero hour or office hours. After that, four periods will run for 55 minutes each. Tuesday and Thursday, periods four, three, two, eight. Wednesday and Friday periods 5176. There will be an hour lunch on these days and students will return for their two afternoon 30 minute sessions. Period five and one will run Tuesday, period four, three on Wednesday, period six, seven on Thursday and period eight, two on Friday. Office hours will conclude the day from 2.30 to 3.15 p.m. So what happens when we begin hybrid model? Students will follow the same times as the newly developed remote daily schedule. Students choosing a hybrid schedule will learn on campus two morning sessions each week. All of our students will learn together via video conferencing tools such as Zoom, regardless of their location on or off campus. 
Finally, students will be phased back into the building over a few weeks. A hybrid model where full cohorts of students attend will take some time. Our students will be grouped into an orange cohort, a blue cohort, and an all remote cohort. The orange cohort will learn on campus on Tuesdays and Wednesdays during the morning session only. The blue cohort will learn on campus on Thursday and Friday during the morning session only. An all remote cohort will learn remotely or off campus Monday through Friday. For the remainder of the schedule, students will learn remotely or off campus. These times include Monday morning sessions, Monday afternoon sessions, Tuesday through Friday afternoon sessions, and all office hours. Families will be notified of their grouping prior to the beginning of a hybrid model. What happens for students who elected to remain fully remote? For families that have chosen remote only, students will be in live connections only. Students will learn with their originally scheduled second semester teacher and classmates. They will not be placed into a separate section where they learn on an online platform such as Edgenuity. Finally, students will learn together via video conference tools like Zoom, regardless of whether they are on campus or off campus. Here's the grid format of the in-person hybrid daily schedule. If you look closely, you, you will see they are the exact same time frames as our newly developed remote schedule for second semester. The only thing that's different on this grid is under the days of the week, you will see some text in blue. This blue text indicates where each cohort, orange, blue, or all remote, will be learning, the location of their learning. For instance, under Tuesday, you'll see the orange cohort will learn on campus for the morning session. The blue cohort will be in live connection, remote all day, and the all remote cohort will be the live connection all day. When will students start the hybrid schedule on campus? Well, first and foremost, students will return when it is safe. Then students will return on campus per the phases outlined below. The first phase, students with special needs will return. During the second phase, freshmen and transfer students will return. In phase three, all orange and blue cohorts will return on campus. I thank you for your time. Please feel free to direct any questions to me, Michelle Papanicolau at papanicolau at fenton100.org or Jovan Lozadovich at Lozadovich at fenton100.org. Thank you and have a great day. Great job. Michelle and Yovan in preparing that. That has been distributed to our communities that you all know. Just a follow-up uh, in regards to that. Uh, we have, um, as you know, we have a sign-up grid. Uh, we uh, put it out to all of our stakeholders, our parents and, and students uh, in regards to what they would prefer uh, when uh, second semester, when we go hybrid, in-person hybrid. And the rough data so far is about 400, peop uh, 400 students uh, prefer to be in-person hybrid and the remaining approximately 1,100, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, approximately 1,100 um, chose uh, fully remote. So just to give you that data right now where we're at. Um, so uh, we're looking forward um, to seeing our kids next semester when it, when it is safe. Moving on to our last item here is our Fenton's report card. We've been highlighting this, highlighting this all year. Uh, finally, ISBE has uh, formalized uh, the numbers and has given us our, our, our formal rating and it's been published uh, actually last month. Just wanna go over the highlights. I've, I've, I've mentioned this to you before and, and, and communicated to the community because we had the tentative numbers. Uh, again, this year we're a commendable school. That's our summative designation. It's like our grade, our graduation rate remains strong. Uh, same from last year, 94% graduation rate. Um, our ninth grade on track, basically our day on track to graduate in four years, not five or four and a half, but in, five, uh, in four years, um, it's at 97%. Uh, it was at 90% a couple of years ago, continues to go up. Just an amazing job. Our teachers and all of the stakeholders here, uh, our Fenton are doing, shout out to all of them, as well as the administrators and the parents just pushing their kids uh, to that next level. In our ten attendance rate, um, I would like to see that high go higher, but you know it's, it's COVID season starting in March. But this is the same number actually dipped down uh, to 93%, where I believe it was 94% last year. 
Now, there is a website that uh, folks can uh, go to and take a look at and, and look more deeply. We're going to publish that on our website in our, our book. You've seen this before. Kind of like the same thing here, which I, I placed in, in, um, uh, in the highlights. Uh, people could take a look at it, see where we're at. Um, but once again, highlighting uh, the great work um, our students, our staff, the board, our teachers are doing uh, in regards to that, to, be, to have another year of commendable school uh, as a, uh, a summative designation or grade, uh, it's rewarding. And I hope you feel that, and I, I, you know, the stakeholders, when I, when I go out to the community and talk to them, they're, they, they like what they're seeing and, and uh, the momentum where Fenton is going, not just, you know, physical, the, the, uh, the borders, uh, the building and the mortars, but academically as well, the programming we're offering, um, uh, the sports, the clubs, uh, the different cl classes and courses we offer, and, and the way we treat our, our, our students. I think um, we're moving in the right direction, and I'll continue to say that because I truly believe that that is the case here at Fenton. With that, that is the District 100 informational item report. So is there any questions by the board? I know that was a lot. That was an hour and 24 minutes. It wow. was. It was a lot. Hey, James, it's Patty. Hey, Patty. Um, uh, so the report card, that just reflects last school year, 19 to 20, right? Yes. Yep. So it doesn't show anything about, like, the attendance for this fall or anything like that. Do you have no. any idea about that for the oh, fall? We have been doing it. This fall right now, we have been doing that uh, uh, in-house. It's falling about 90, 91 92 percent uh, at the beginning of the year I was a little bit uh, worried that we were hitting 89 88 percent but it still stays strong as you know we have our deans um, and our teachers encouraging students hey look you got to participate um, as you know our deans are just rock stars going to people's home hey look James how come you're not in what's going on how what can we do to help you is it a Wi-Fi issue uh, what is the issue so um, I think we're gonna land Patty and the rest of the board, about 92, 93% again next year at this time when I make that formal report. Yeah, it's a tough time. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. Paul? Here we go. Edit, unmute. <clears throat> all right. Thank you, James. Thank you. Those were all great uh, presentations. Uh, we move on to the consent agenda. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments regarding any items on the consent agenda? Uh, if not, uh, actually, I had one question, Bruce. If you're there, um, here, here, yes. Okay, just a quick question on page 57 um, with the summary summary report. I just had a, I just wanted a clarification on the middle of the middle of the page regarding the expenditures at 38.51 percent. Is that is that where is that a percentage of our budget? Uh, for for this year, um, you're at, you're on the budget summary report. Um, yes, on page right. fifty-seven. Okay. And the line item, where's the fifty-seven percent? I'm just looking for that on here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And the it's in the middle of the page. The subtotal in uh, yellow, all, all the way to the right, where it's the percent expended. Right, right. Um, the 39, 38.5, is that what you're asking about? Right. I just want to make sure that that's, is that a percentage amount of um, the percentage amount that has been expended uh, from the budgeted, budgeted amount this year so far? That That is, yes, that is correct. That statement, yes. Okay. So if later on that let's say later on this year and we start going back into school and those expenses will rise we should still be in good shape as far as uh um staying in budget then even though that yeah you know that's our goal that's our hope we'll do everything to you know control costs as as, as we typically do this is 
obviously a little bit of a of a different unusual circumstance, but right. right stands, you know, we're, we're trending under budget compared to last year. If you look at November of 19, we're at, we were at 42%, we're at 38.5 now. Yep. So that, that's good. And, and most of our line items up above, if you look at each uh, perspective area of expense, salary benefits, so on, um, are trending under uh, when you compare it to last year. So um, not that unusual um, when you know we our supplies would you would think would be down and and they are uh, just because of you know the the setting that we're operating under right now. So um, likely, will our spending will probably start to trickle up, trickle up um, in the next uh, semester, depending on when you know we are able to return, and hopefully you know that'll be sooner rather than later. But you know we'll continue to to watch those expenses and and um, contain costs as, as, uh, as uh, in the manner that we possibly can, the, the tightest manner that we can. Right, right. No, I understand, I understand, Bruce. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make sure I, I was reading that right, as far as that percentage amount. So, uh, yep. yeah, you're right on. All right, great, thanks. thanks yeah, and are we on through. track or are we under this? Yeah. Right. And and we're and we're tracking under right now, yes, for our expenditures. Okay, great. Thanks, Bruce. Patty, you're okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. If there's no further questions, may I have a, may I have a motion to I'm sorry. The agenda, agenda as presented. And Paul. Uh, I'm sorry, I got it. Yeah. On that, on the discussion surrounding the, the curriculum changes, um, you know, is, is that just going forward? Was was there, I was just like wondering, you know, I know we probably identified, uh, you know, areas of improvement that we we needed to adjust, right, for the second semester. Do we have, you know, kind of a framework on, you know, what those were, those areas that we'd recognize as, you know, maybe things we can improve on. You know, so, so you know, the justification for the change and, you know, I, I know that we probably identified those, but what, what were they exactly? Sure, I could talk about that. So this is not part of the consent agenda, uh, Kit, you're going yeah. back, going back a little I, bit. May I just take, yeah. take time out just to answer your question and Michelle could jump in and Yovan could jump in as well. Uh, Part of the change was basically coming from our surveys. As you know, we send out a survey to our parents, our students, and our staff. And the, uh, 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 the conclusion was that, hey, look, we need more contact times, as you know, um, and we need to adjust uh, the schedule so kids could, uh, uh, whether it's participate or, or stay engaged uh, in their classes with their, with, with their teachers. Basically from the survey, uh, trigger that. That's my take on it. Michelle Yovan? Uh, yeah, that was the extent of it. We wanted to make sure that we had more contact time. The afternoon sessions that you see, um, we're going to use those more as like seminar opportunities. So it gives students another chance to to um, um, to engage in different ways. Perhaps it's through an assessment. It could be through a mini lesson that the teachers are going to do and a reteach opportunity. Um, so, yeah, we, we really heard that we really needed more time. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we utilize that time on Monday, especially as kind of a, uh, an intro to the week, whether it's through um, some SEL processes that we have or just a basic um, outline for the week for our from our teachers to our, our students and we get a chance to see them immediately. Uh, Michelle, anything to add? Um, yeah, so sorry, Henry. I'm, I'm just going back into our notes from um, our work with the Highlander Institute. They worked with our design team, which was comprised of uh, administration, counselor, teachers, um, and we looked at, you know, our bright spots and our pain points and our looming questions, and they really broke down the data. I mean, we had slides and slides of data that we were looking um, for gaps and, and, and those standout pieces of data. I mean, besides the schedule, there were, there were a number of other practices that 
we realized we had to, you know, continue growing, like our use of breakout rooms and our, our, our um, connectedness and how we develop that in our classrooms. But really um, that face-to-face -face time, it was, um, it was a tough one because it was split. Um, our students really wanted the flexibility and um, they were kind of split on the topic. Parents were split on the topic um, and, and teachers were kind of split on the topic. So that's how we, we kind of landed um, it, it kind of in the middle there, you know, we're not full all day, every day from eight to three on, on the computer, but rather we have some uh, innovative and, and thoughtful approaches to how we can bring students together and, and what manner we do that, when we do that, how the length of time we do that and how we continue to have office hours and, and asynchronous learning time available for students. So. Um, I don't know if that, that helps answer your question, but that's kind of the process we use with um, the Highlander Institute. Yeah, so, so if I understand this right, what we used to you know, guide us towards the curriculum changes was the Highlander, uh, was also derived from the survey that uh, uh, came about, the results of those surveys from students, teachers, uh, parents. Um, so all that put together, uh, I think, was a good it was a guide is that about yeah, yeah that's exactly what highlander did was took us through all of that data they compiled it. they helped us aggregate it yes that's okay. what helped us and then like i'm just kind of going through my mind is okay so we've got we've got the plan you know what's the so so you know i look at strategy i look at planning i look at execution and delivery right so you know, what's the time frame of that if we were to do that, like execution and delivery of uh, the plan and scheduling? Is that going to, you know, obviously it's going to take effect right away in, in uh, next semester. Right, right. Can the plan and the execution, we're ready to deliver that uh, January 4th for remote learning. This is ready to go um, um, uh, January 4th. The trick is when it's safe to come back, when we, the hybrid kicks in, uh, as, as Michelle pointed out, there's different phases of bringing kids back into school, nice, small, uh, doable uh, number of kids coming in the building so that we can matriculate them appropriately um, um, and, and accordingly to, uh, to, to, their, to their needs. That's why we have special ed coming in first, ELLs coming in first, then our ninth graders who never been in the building, our transfer students who transfer from another school, uh, that sort of thing. But the planning, the curriculum change has been made already. Uh, there is, uh, right now, I think this will carry us throughout the new year, and we are. I'm def. I'm hopeful, and from what I'm, the data I've been seeing is that we're back to normal in the fall. Uh, uh, yeah, I agree. I think I think you're realistic about that timeline too. Um, so, I know that vaccinations and all that are being uh, administered. Um, you know, for uh, health health professionals, educators. Uh, first as a priority. Um, I don't know. Is there is there a rollback uh, game plan at all in case like I don't know some some the third spike happens? You know what? We yeah, we're this out of our control. They call the shot. Who's the first div? Who gets the first div? And so forth. Uh, we got to get uh, trusted to science and our our, our leaders uh, at the state and at the local level uh, to make that determination. We follow suit, and I think the best thing, as you know, in pandemic, we got to stay united. We got to stay united with our with our leaders at the state level as well as the the local level. And that's what we've been doing. And I think that we've been successful with that, kid. Yeah. Um, thanks for entertaining my questions. I know I had to. I was. I, I don't know. I was waiting for an opportune time, and I think I waited a little bit longer. So thank you for sharing. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So we go back to consent agenda. Oh. Yeah. Let's go back to the consent agenda. Um, so may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So move. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry, who was that? Leo. I'm sorry, Leo. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Patty. Roll call, please. Patty. Yes, Patty, yeah. I know. Move. Peyton Howell. Marianne, you're, uh, you're on mute. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to off me. I'm here. I'm thank here. You. Jello? Jello? 
Yes. Figueroa. Yes. Yes. Ramirez. Yes. Ting Po Fong. Yes. Wiedemann. Yes. All right. Motion is uh, motion is passed. Next item is the Bensonville Tax Consortium resolution. James. Just real quick, so who, what is this Benson, Bensonville Tax Consortium resolution? Really, this resolution is about this consortium hiring a new legal firm. First step is, what is the Bensonville Tax Consortium? It's basically all of the taxing body in Bensonville, okay, joining together to take care of tax-related issues. So who are they? That's Fenton, that's District 2, that's the Fire Department, that's the Village, that's the Park District, and the Library. To give you more detail, Bruce is going to step into it and talk about the resolution. No, that, that's exactly right, James. Thanks for that uh, introduction. So this resolution, uh, the board periodically does pass these resolutions um, either to update our legal firms or update, you know, just a, a, a refreshed resolution um, on behalf of the consortium members. So as James mentioned, there's um, six members uh, total in the consortium, including um, Fenton and the newest one is the Bensonville Fire District. So that's that's great because that helps kind of spread the cost. So, and the intent of the whole consortium really is to intervene in tax assessment appeals and then share that those legal costs. And kind of what's driving this timeline right now is the um, updated resolution to reflect the new legal firm that's coming on board. Our previous legal firm had a number of uh, conflicts um, with other clients that they were representing, um, they elected to just uh, uh, and suggested really to pull out uh, because of those conflicts. So um, we did have a secondary legal firm, um, and the, this is the firm that is kind of be the lead firm now going forward. Um, Klein, Thorpe, and Jenkins. That name may sound familiar to you. That's the firm that the district uses as well, and they also do uh, tax uh, intervention appeals. So. Um, we've, we've, as I said, we use the firm, of course, here at, at uh, District 100, um, and the consortium has used them on a periodic basis when there has been a conflict with the other firm. Um, now they'll just be taking over and be the primary firm for the, on behalf of the consortium. So um, we're asking in order to, to make that happen um, for the board and all the boards, actually, uh, of the consortium uh, membership to act on the attached resolution for approval, and then we will forward that on to the village um, that kind of manages um, the consortium on, on the uh, members' uh, behalf. Hey, Bruce, it's Patty. Does, you mentioned the village, um, so I imagine the village of Bensonville, but so since it's a Bensonville tax consortium, um, does that include uh, Wooddale 7? And um, Woodale, Woodale yeah, too, or that's a, great, that's a great question, Patty. I'm, great, I'm glad you brought it up because we have a, a separate consortium for Wooddale. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we belong to we belong to two consortiums: one for Bensonville and one for Wooddale. And it does would include District Seven, the Village of Wooddale, um, the Park District, Fire District, all, all those similar, uh, if not the same, entities um, as they do in in Bensonville. But it's just uh, each community has their own. A consortium which we happen to belong to uh, each one um, because of that. Our feeder districts are in their respective uh, villages where they uh, belong to it as well. Got it. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, thank you, uh, Bruce and James. Uh, any other further questions? If not, may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the resolution by the Bensonville Tax Consortium Resolution Intervention in Property Tax Assessment Appeals as presented. So moved. Uh, thank you, Patty. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mary Ann. Roll call, please. Peyton Hill. Yes. Figueroa. Yes. Ramirez. Yes. Pong. Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Excuse me, Jalwood? Yes. Okay, motion has passed. Uh, next item is the 2021 2022 
program of studies. James, that's yours. Thank you. Uh, every some, uh, every false, uh, fall, our instructional leadership team meet to review, to, to look at uh, our courses and plan for the changes for the upcoming school year. In this case, it's a, a school year 2021-2022 uh, to make the appropriate changes for this year. Um, uh, here to present is our Director of Curriculum, uh, Michelle Papanicolau, and also our Division Leader, uh, Mr. Brian Augustine. Hi, members of the board. Thank you, Superintendent Antinko. Um, we're excited to present some changes. I'm, I'm glad to have Brian Augustine, our Division Leader for STEM here, to talk about some of these changes. He's really been working hard over the last couple of years to continue to innovate our programming and, and move it forward. So um, most of the changes are coming from his division. So I'm glad he uh, agreed to come and join me today in this. So yes, as Mr. Antango mentioned, we do this every fall. We, we look at our course guide. We say what kind of new courses are needed, what kind of courses may be archived, um, what kind of name changes might be needed. So um, in your memo, I've, I've outlined all of those and I'll take you through those. Um, Brian and I will take you through those quickly here. Um, I, yeah, so we'll start with the area of mathematics. We have four new courses. Um, math three is just a continuation of what we've started. So um, last year we talked to you all about, or maybe even the year before, because we've been at this um, at least in a pilot form now for some for some time. Um, we had a pilot and then last year we started math one and two and this year we're finishing up our math integrated math sequence with math three. So we, we've now made a total shift from um, an algebra geometry, algebra two sequence to an integrated math one, math two and math three sequence. Um, just to remind you, the rationale for this change is really about um, allowing uh, students to solve real world problems and um, think more rigorous high level thinking um, in, in an integrated math sequence, students are integrating algebra, geometry and statistics skills together. Um, most problems in our world don't um, require math in isolation. So we really think this allows them to um, apply mathematics in a more realistic way. And then, um, so we'll finish that off next year with the um, final course in that sequence, Math 3. Um, then at the bottom, we, we have, at the bottom of the slide in front of you, we have Math 1, Part 1, and Math 1, Part 2. So part of um, our, our students' rights <laughs> and our obligation is to ensure that our students um, who have IEPs and receive special education services, receive the same curriculum as, our, as their general education peers. So these are the courses that we will start with um, in, in, in starting an integrated math program for our students with IEPs. So our students with IEPs will have the Math 1 curriculum actually over two years. So the first year they will have Math Part one and the second year they will have math one part two. This is not every student with an IEP. These are students who um, for one reason or another are being placed outside of the general education setting and need to um, move through the curriculum um, in a different manner. I will let Brian talk about calculus three. So here at Fenton we have students that begin in three different starting points. The first starting point is math one. Our second starting point is accelerated geometry. And then our third starting point is accelerated algebra two. And this is primarily, calculus three is primarily for the group of students that begin our program as a freshman in accelerated algebra two, where they then move on to accelerated pre-calculus sophomore year, and then go into Calc BC their junior year. That led us to the question of, what happened to that Fenton student who has completed calculus BC, their senior year? What course exists in terms of that? This new course in this particular case would be Calc 3. Now we've researched a number of schools that, um, number of schools and their course offerings, and almost all of them 
begin began their program using net math at you so let me talk you through in terms of what this entails. Um, what does calc 3 entails so the course that we are presenting to you mirrors the equivalent undergraduate course spread over the high school academic year at U of I, this course is actually a semester course but our high school students who participate in this program will have the entire academic um, year to complete the coursework. As for the areas that is covered in this net math calculus three, um, there's two specific areas, multivariate functions and vectors and totaling four credit. Other calculus three programs actually separate the two and offer two separate classes, Calculus 3 Multivariates and Calculus 3 Vectors. But the program that we're talking about here with Net Math combines the two. We are looking at both of these components in our Cal 3 program. Mm -hmm. Now, to complete this course, we'll receive four transferable semester hours for Math 241 and a college transcript through U of I. They're actually a college U of I student. They get the login as a college student. They have the U of I expectations. Now, one piece is there is a fee for taking part in this course. But what we can say is that um, U of I offers scholarships for students to participate, and it covers the fee for this. And if, it, if they receive the scholarship and financial assistance, it can also count towards additional courses through the net math program of U of I. Um, net math consists of many different math courses above Calc. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, it's, it's exciting that our students would um, be earning credit from the university of Illinois um, and um, being a part of their programming moving forward. Um, so that is that concludes math. Uh, the section where we have new courses is um, in our career pathways areas. I talked to you about career pathways last year and how we're really trying to ensure that our courses are aligned with the Illinois State Board of Education's career and technical education um, requirements. Um, by doing this, what we're ensuring is that we are eligible for Perkins 5 funding. So every time we look to add a course or redo a course, we're making sure that the course description and what we teach inside those courses align with what the Illinois State requirements are for us to get funding. So what we've essentially done is take three courses from our culinary track, archive them, and create new courses in a manner that will allow us to leverage our funding in a better way and to ensure more rigorous and career-oriented opportunities for our students. So we, we are including a career pathway in the area of hospitality and tourism and we had culinary before, so it's, it's not necessarily brand new, but we're up in the ante on um, some areas within the curriculum that include exposure to entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship, um, exposure to career awareness, exposure to more um, technical skills, possibly with the certifications, so they can go out into um, um, higher paying jobs more readily. So we um, redesigned and uh, are including a new course called Nutrition and Culinary Arts One. That will be a semester class. It is similar to what we offer right now for Culinary One. And then Nutrition and Culinary Arts Two will be a year long class. So that will look quite different. It will include um, international um, cuisine, again, the entrepreneurship investigation, um, a, a lot of the um, career and food service industry. So we're gonna extend it beyond just coming in to cook, right? We're, we're, we're actually looking um, at the careers within this field. 
Um, the other, the other um, path within the culinary is the human services side. Um, we have um, a new course that we're offering on that end, and I'll let Brian talk about that. To piggyback off of what Michelle just talked about, previously we kind of talked about career explorations and giving students just a little bit of, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Now we're much more intentional in terms of career oriented positioning for our students. So when they do leave us, they're gonna leave with not only the skills, but they're gonna also have certifications. And so we're fine tuning our program of studies now to a state for additional funding, but at the same time, adhering to our mission of making sure that there's rigor and it's relevant to our students and enable them to have those positions of success in the future. So the class that um, we're adding to our program of study is called Food Preparation and Health Management, which focuses on the planning and preparing of different foods centered on the nutritional and health benefits of those specific ingredients and menus. Think about it in terms of someone who wants to be a dietitian or a nutritionist. Um, along with the basic food preparation skills, students engage in real world applications such as food costs and how to be a savvy consumer. Um, students also learn about recipe conversions, which further emphasizes to the students the importance of a balanced diet while making those meals um, that is very tasty and worthwhile. Um, <laughs> is intended for our grades 11 through 12 students. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I think the most important thing to consider is these, these curricula are, are most of the time mandated through the Illinois State Board of Education. So the topics listed in ours will, are very similar to the topics are required of ISB um, in order to really be technically qualify as a, a career and technical education course. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, you will see in your memo a number of um, course archives. Uh, I just want to clarify what where these are coming from. First of all, some of them are from historically low course requests. Like we haven't run them in over a few years because the the interest in them are just not great enough. So we're going to archive them for now. Um, uh, some of these. Or particularly related to that architecture, technical drafting, drafting. Um, it doesn't mean we don't want to do those. Those will be part of a rebuild when we start rebuilding our manufacturing engineering technology um, uh, pathways. Um, we, we do foresee those being revived in some way, but for right now, we're doing a little cleanup. <laughs> so we can clean up and rebuild in some cases. Um, the other is um, just as I mentioned, the redevelopment of the programs of study. So, like in in the case of math, we're retiring some of our courses so we can um, redevelop this program of study. Uh, culinary, we're retiring so we can redevelop, and and even some of those other CTE courses, we're retiring so we can redevelop. Um, you'll also notice um, that I noted that we did some course name changes. This is again in the area of special education. We want to be very careful that. There's no identifiable language in our transcripts or in our documents that when um, others are looking at uh, a student's transcript or their courses or report cards, there's nothing that identifies them as having a disability or, um, or receiving special kinds of services. So in some of the courses, we've removed the terminology that explicitly state um, special education or and in these cases, we had a, a number of classes named life skills, and we thought that was pretty identifiable, and we changed all the life skills courses to general. Um, so th that was one other major change we made in our guide this year. So, next slide. Um, uh, the one other also pretty big change is last year we called it our college and career program guide. Our counselors asked that we um, rethink that name a little bit. Um, to align with industry standards when colleges come back to look at our program of study. Um, they don't, they said that's not really a common term. So it's either like curriculum guide or 
Um, in our case, we went with program of studies. It's a, it's a pretty common term to call our curriculum guide. So we're now called the program of studies and it'll be published on our website after your approval, of course, of the changes proposed here. And course selection will start on the 4th of January when we, re when we return for the second semester. So um, I thank you in advance for your support and um, we're here to answer any questions. Well, of course I have a couple. Of course, that's good. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Um, so why not a curriculum guide? I mean, that's, that's pretty explanatory to students. You know, it's the curriculum. It's, um, you know, program of studies. It just... Well, honestly, the program of studies probably better reflects the direction we're going. Um, and it's not just uh, about singular anymore. It's um, about um, programs that build on one another. That's been an emphasis within the career pathways and even within the academic realm. We don't want these singular courses and it's not just about the curriculum, it's about the programs that we develop. So that's why we went with the program of studies. Okay. Okay, and then on the math, um, let's go back to my minutes. Um, Algebra or no math three, mm -hmm. um, including um, so you're going through all this math, and then the last thing is in social emotional learning. I, why is that in there? Oh, thanks for asking that. That's awesome um, that you brought that up. So the the math department um, has been working through developing the competencies that all students who go through a program of study in mathematics will develop and they've used this integrated approach. So all of what's listed there are competencies that our teachers have feel are important for student success in mathematics, um, including the area of social emotional learning. I believe if we drill down a little bit further into that particular topic, their competency in social emotional learning really has to do with um, collaboration. So they want to ensure that students not only know how to solve problems, but they know how to do it collaboratively. So that's why that social emotional learning piece is in there. I get it because usually math three kids are kind of math geeks and not socially. No, I'm kidding. It was a joke. It's no, and it's in every single course. Yeah. So, you, you, um, you know, if it's not in the description, we, we actually, in this brand new course, we wanted to, ensure, and if it's not in the descriptions for math one and two, for this new course, we wanted to ensure that those competencies were laid out. But yeah, it's nice our students can collaborate and have some social emotional skills while they do that. Sure. Yeah, so it's, it's all it's all it's all there. It's based on the six pillars. It's the sixth pillar is what yeah. the math are calling. Yeah, they have pillars. I call them competencies. They call them pillars. It, it works. There, it all means the same thing in the end. Um, I, I was wondering, you know, just in terms of planning for the curriculum, I'm sure it took a lot of work and dedication and hours of study and, and uh, preparation to do this. Um, the, the question I have is, well, just timing um, to, and I, again, I'm sure there's preparation involved in it, but I wanted, I'm just curious, um, you know, mid-year, COVID, um, you know, are we, are we, you know, are we aligned to do this, you know, as far as like, you know, our students, our instruction uh, people, I mean, just are, are we, are we maybe taking in too much? I mean, no. Um, uh, thanks yeah. for asking that. Um, so this is to begin next school year. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, this is not um, something that's brand new in any way. Yeah. We've been looking at these competencies for a while and the the inclusion of this math three was just um, a matter of the final leg. Our teachers um, have already been dabbling in this curriculum and, and developing it along the way. So it's not going to be a major leap to go from that algebra two to that math three because they've already been embedding the practices um, in pilot ways um, already. So it, I, I think we'll be okay on that kit. 
Um, and for the culinary, we, we to consider that, like, ah, are we like biting off more? Uh, but we talked with the teachers um, and you know, because that culinary one isn't too big of a stretch, our major undertaking will be that culinary two. And ultimately it takes a lot of what they already did in courses that they've had along the lines and it just kind yeah. of matches it together. So they don't have to completely re um, invent the entire wheel. They just have to put it together in, in a, a meaningful way. So I think we'll be able to it's more so it's more so the planning in culinary two um, because culinary two is going to have um, a certification component to it, which is a predetermined curriculum. Um, and so that prepares the students for that certification in culinary. Two. Do we need to modify our um our FMLA area? Do we have to do anything with, you know, providing more um, equipment and area in order to yep. accommodate these? Patty, that's a great question. Um, because we now have verified career technical education, Perkins 5 um, approved courses, we can actually get more funding um, than we've ever had, especially in this area. So um, I do foresee that we'll need to, at some point, start thinking about the updated equipment that goes along with the ability to carry carry this out. Right, right now, I, our teachers are great. They've been dealing with what they've had for quite a while now, but with the increase in funding, we would anticipate that we'd like to, um, you know, consider the, allocating some of that to updating our equipment. Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I, um, can you still hear me? Cause my internet's really bad. Um, mm. the, so we don't have the, the interest in drafting technical drafting and architectural drafting anymore. It hasn't been there for a few years, which is, is that, am I reading that correctly? Yeah. It's, it's kind of, um, it's been disheartening to, to me to see that each year them not have enough, uh, course requests to run. Usually that's like under 10. Um, but we have some real um, innovative and thoughtful ideas about how to revive that program with some capstone experiences that might be pretty alluring to students. So um, I wouldn't um, let it lie for too long. Um, I think it's just a matter of rebuilding it in a more innovative way. Okay. Yeah, all of that, the computer, the web design, all that is some... Um, it's really surprising that um, well, and know, honestly, that technical yeah. aspect is. Yeah. And, and like I said, some of this is just a matter of cleanup before we rebuild. I think you'll see a number of um, more conversations like we're having about culinary next year at this time where um, we'll rebuild programs of study in a manner that are fundable and um, really just um, are designed well. Um, right now we have a lot of courses that are just standalone and they don't even qualify for career and technical education courses the way they're designed. So I like, keep them on the books right now, the way they stand, the interest isn't there, the uh, funding isn't there with them. And we we have a better way of working these programs of study. Forward. So I think I think we'll be okay. But yeah, it's um it's it, it it's hard. Um, we have added um, computer um, science courses through that AP Computer Principles and AP Computer Science A, and we will continue to build out that computer sciences. So you'll see some drop off, but you're going to see a number um, more come on next fall. We just didn't want to bite off much than we can chew this year because we are in a pandemic. We're trying to be really careful and balanced about how much we pursue um, because this is just the work of and Brian, this is the work of the teachers as well. So, you know, they can only do so much um, during this time. So we're just trying right. to do it. Right. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Brian. All right. Great. Yep. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Michelle. Then may I have a motion that the Board of Education archive the 2020-2021 college and career program 
guide and approve the 2021-2022 uh, program of studies with the changes as presented. I'll make a motion. All right, thank you, Jack. Can we have a second? I'll second. All right, thank you, Marianne. Roll call, please. Peyton Hell. Yes. Ramirez. Ramirez. Yes. Ting Po Pong. Um, archiving, yes. I'm not sure about the curriculum. And I, I think um, I, I, I'm going to abstain. I don't know if I could do that. Is that is that a thing where I can just not say yes or no? <laughs> yes, yeah, you can abstain. You can abstain. Jalwick? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. yes. All right, motion is passed. Um, we move now on to the committee reports. Uh, Kit, anything on Bensonville Community Foundation? Uh, the, so, so we did have a meeting this, this month, um, but uh, we're seeing an influx in uh, Bensonville Community Foundation donations online. And um, I, I would encourage everyone to go onto the Bensonville Community Foundation and uh, donate. It's a 501c3 and it's deductible so, and it supports the community. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Finance Committee, we have nothing new unless, Marianne, do you have anything? I have nothing. Okay. Uh, nothing on the IASB delegate right now. Um, Leo, anything on LEND? No, maybe James has something. Well, I just wanted to give Leo a shout out. As you know, he is the president of the NETSEC uh, board there. And uh, what a wonderful job he's doing. Um, um, I believe he is the first president, uh, Latino president there um, at NETSEC. Just wanted to give a shout out. He commands the room uh, when he talks and he gets the board meeting done much faster than I do. Uh, so <laughs> a shout out to you. Some topics we did cover that Leo was trying to talk about. Uh, the press policies that we discussed with our first reading today uh, was reviewed and passed that same day. And we hired a new uh, a CSBO uh, there at, um, uh, at that site. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, that was uh, NEDSEC, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, policy committee, we had a meeting today. Uh, Patty and Kid, I don't know anything you want to add. It was pretty much to the point and short. Hey, Paul, you skipped Lend. I'm sorry? You skipped Lend. Lend was, I'm sorry, Leo. Yes. No, Leo. you didn't. No, I thought I said Lend. Yeah, for Leo. Yeah. You I'm did. sorry. I said Lend. Right, right. No, I think we have them all covered. Um, all right, we move on. Our next board meeting is going to be Wednesday, January 20th, 2021 at 7 p.m. Uh, then may I have a motion to go and a second to go into closed session for the purpose of the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance or dismissal of specific employees of the public body or legal counsel for the public body, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee an employee of the public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. However, a meeting to consider an increase in compensation to a specific employee of a public body that is subject to the local government wage increase transparency act may not be closed and shall be open to the public and posted 
and held in accordance with this Act 5 ILCS 120-2, Section C1, and collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or the representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedule for one or more classes of employees, 5 ILCS 120-2, C2. I will make the motion, Paul. Okay, thank you, Marion. May I have a second? I'll second. Okay, thank you, Patty. Roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Howell. Yeah. Ramirez. Ramirez. Yes. Ting Popong. Ting Popong. Yes. Yes. Jalowick. Yes. Figueroa. Yes. Wiedemann. Yes. All right, uh, Jim, can you let us know when we are in closed session? Jim, let us know when we're back in open session. We're back. All right, we're back. All right, then uh, may I have a motion and a second to adjourn? I will make the motion to adjourn and happy holidays. Okay, thank you, Mary Ann. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, roll call, please. Peyton Hall. Yes. Yes. Jalik. Yes, yes, and Merry Christmas, everybody. You Figueroa. too, Patty. Figueroa. Yes. Ramirez. Yes. Ting Popong. Yes, and happy holidays. Be safe. Weedman. Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, then this has passed. Everyone have a merry and safe Christmas. And uh, enjoy this very unusual year, but uh, make the best of it and just have a Merry Christmas. Take care. You too. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.